Okay, so where we're at is you have a couple sets of, of notes, and I'm gonna do this this week, the introduction, and then move into the first session. Um, I started, I've been teaching this foundation class since 2004. I think actually it's 2003, the ministry, after I had uh, been planting churches for a while in the 90s, then the Lord kind of uh, touched my heart and we ejected and came out of planting churches for a while. Uh, we went and did business for five years, Amy and I, and then stepped back in and we did this equipping ministry idea in 2004. But I started meeting with little pockets. I think I had 12 groups at one point <clears throat> of, um, of men and women, little threes and fours. I would meet with an El Dorado and uh, I was teaching uh, and showing Jesus from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation. And we would just go week by week, sometimes through chapters, and sometimes we'd you know, move through a book pretty quick, but it was a little elongated process. But the point was seeing Christ in all the scriptures. And so what developed out of that then was we began, the ministry began to grow, more people were coming, and, um, and the Lord had locked me in on this uh, verse of, um, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I've got it here, verse 11. It says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Paul is talking there about the believers and their walk in the judgment day. Actually, that's the context here, is that there's a day where we're all going to stand, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to show whether our works were hay and stubble and they burn up, or it's gold and silver. And so there's a great judgment day coming where everything in our life, how we steward our time and our treasure, it's, a, it's a, going to be a profound day. And so for unbelievers, it'll be the book of life judgment of whether they spend eternal life with the Lord or not. For the believers... We're through that, if you will, by the blood of Jesus, and our names are in the book of life. But there still is a judgment. It's called the Bema Seat in some, where we'll be judged for works and what we're doing. It won't be about eternal salvation, but it will be about what we did, how we stewarded this time. So this age is the great investment period for the age to come. And um, I don't know how all that works, and we need more study on that, but there is, we don't earn our salvation, but there is some dynamics where what we do now relates to what we do in the age to come. Because there's going to be a real new earth, a real new heaven. We're going to have bodies. We're going to have jobs. We're going to have, we're going to be moving around on the earth and have assignments. Uh, one place in the scripture will talk about us stewarding cities. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and it's, it's due to how we stewarded our life right now. And so we share that. And I hope that doesn't tumble anybody into shame and Oh my gosh, I've waited a bunch, wasted a bunch of my life because this is not a normal investment. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio here. The grace of God makes this not, he's, he's so generous what he does. You know, a good stewarded hour here is translated into glory in the, year, in, the, in the future. And so praise God for that. And even a thief on the cross in that last hour where Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise, he will not be disappointed, though his whole life was wasted. But we wanted to, in the context of that, here we are in 1 Corinthians 3, and Paul writes about, the verse 10 is, says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. So one of his churches and to the saints there in Corinth, he says, let each one take care how he builds upon it. And then the verse I gave you, for no one can lay a foundation other than that one that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And we read those verses so often, I think it's, I just want to encourage you to remember, he just said that the foundation we build our faith on is on a person. That seems normal to us, but back then, some of these phrases, and I'm going to read some of these verses, would have been just stunning. In my first paragraph here, I talked about Galatians 4.19. Paul says there, I'm in the pains of childbirth until Christ be formed in you, till the anointed one, till a person, till this Messiah that just came and died and rose again is fully formed in you. So what that's alluding to is that you can live with an unformed manifestation of Christ. There's growth in. You not only get Christ in you when you're saved by the seed of the Holy Spirit, but there's a process of maturation where he's fully formed within you. Those are stunning phrases, honestly, that are kind of normal to us because we read them all the time. But Paul's revelation about Christ, that he would be in us, um, is a phenomenal thing. Not only, you know, they're, they're struggling with the Pharisees and, and Jews are waiting for someone to liberate them from a foreign army, the Romans. Well, he's saying he did way more than that. He came to liberate us from sin, from sickness, from Satan. This is the true tyranny. 
And then he'll talk about not only did he successfully do that, but that he also now has come inside you. <clears throat> that the very life of a Christian is not something he's actually waiting for you to perform, but for you to agree with, if that makes sense. So we'll have verses like Galatians 2.20, that um, this is, you know, he's, he's, he's praying that they will develop in Christ in them, that Christ in them, I don't live any longer, I've been crucified with Christ, now Christ lives in me. And so it's a possessed life. <laughs> A believer, and really the truth is, if you read Ephesians 2, human beings are being motivated by some kind of spirit. It's either the spirit of disobedience, Ephesians chapter 2, the demonic world, even the, the atheists, the, those that are illiterate about spiritual things, they're being manipulated by the spirit realm, or you're filled with the spirit of God, and the Messiah has come in you by his spirit. And so that being the case, we wanted to teach this class that would base people on the Word of God, but would make it more than a set of principles of Bible stories that we know that we're trying to conform our life to. And I'm not anti-principle, and I'm not anti-we conform our life to good principle. Okay, that's not the point, but the Bible reveals something more. It reveals that God's plan was to redeem us so that He could come live inside us. And that's amazing. That's amazing. He come to live inside. So we're really wanting to see not the increase of our life. We're wanting to see the increase of the life of the Messiah who has made a way to come in us by his redemption and by his spirit. So Ephesians 2.20, I have another verse there. It says, so he talks about the, the gospel and the, and the church being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. And so what we talk about, and I'll mention apostolic and prophetic teaching, and the clear identification of what that means is not a title on a card or on a TV show. Apostolic and prophetic ministry is locked in on pointing people and connecting people to Jesus Christ. Joshua is the word for Jesus. I mean, it's the Hebrew name, Christ the Anointed One. Apostolic and true prophetic ministry are linking us into him as the chief cornerstone of the church and of our very life. We love Colossians 1.18 because foundation class is really a 12-week teaching to establish this. But Colossians 1.18 says, and he is the head of the body, Jesus, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And so we want to see the increase of the supremacy, the first placeness, the, some of you might have the preeminence of Christ in our affections and our thoughts, and really as our life source, not just somebody we keep in mind, but his very life transferring our life. And you've probably heard this phrase, but the New Testament doesn't talk so much about a changed life as it talks about the exchange of a life. The exchanged life is you lay your life down, deny your life, and he gives you the life, his life. It's just a phenomenal thing. And so we want to see the increase of his supremacy in that. And so Ephesians 4.20, he'll talk about and use this phrase, but that's not the way that you learned Christ. And there's a context to that, but I just want to give you the awkward language of Ephesians 4.20 that we're to learn a person. We're to learn the Messiah, learn the anointed one. And so that's what this class is about. The primary subject in the kingdom of God should be God. Okay, sometimes we make it about the, the dome. It should be about the king primary, the kingdom. The dome is important. What are the principles? What the, what's the reality? How's the, king, the dominion of God going to come and overcome all things? We want to know those things. But if you know those things and don't know the king, then you're missing the point and are actually going to get off bubble. And we're going to flow into arguments and all kinds of divisions, I think, about this. So the chief subject of the kingdom of God is God himself. And Jesus Christ, the person, is the central subject of the scriptures. And we'll get into that and we'll look at some of those scriptures and some of you know those things. So just lastly, these 12 sessions will cover the primary historical movements and themes in a sequential way through the scriptures. They're going to serve these sessions as primers for further study as opposed to being exhaustive. I looked at some of my subjects in the, in the sessions. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's 10 sessions we could do on that one. But we're not doing that here. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce to you these main moments moving from creation to the end of the earth, to the end of the age. 
and a, a little bit we're going to reach beyond that and we're going to develop the main themes so that you have that in your heart and your mind and they can be the building blocks for what you and how you study. So we intend to provide and are providing some teachings and booklets and podcasts and other things that can kind of help you, but the best teaching you'll ever receive is from the Holy Spirit. And so I hope these primers serve as they serve up a beginning. They're like the, you know what I mean? It's like the appetizer to the real meal. The real meal is you feasting on Jesus. The real meal is you by the Holy Spirit under the anointing. I mean, the greatest teacher on the planet is the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2, 19 talks about you don't need anyone else to teach you. The Holy Spirit, and he's not negating teachers, but he's trying to tell the believers what glorious access they have in that the Holy Spirit, the one of the, the, the third person of the Trinity is here revealing who Christ is and revealing the word. And so we don't have to just look for smart people and good teachers, okay? So I hope that these sessions, you'll take them and you'll begin to sit on them. You'll begin to meditate on them, talk about them with your uh, families and um, look at the notes a bit and just ask the Holy Spirit to take you a little deeper, okay? So at the end of the day, here's what I'm doing. And I didn't, I didn't have this verse, but it's Colossians 1.27 says, this is the mystery made known to the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. And then 28 says, to this end I labor. Paul's talking about his whole, his whole ministry, his life. To this end I labor. And this is what I struggle to, towards with all his energy which he gives me. And that is to present everyone mature or perfect in Christ. So the goal is not to get us perfect in ministry or in mission, but to get us positioned in Christ. And so I hope you'll look at those verses, Colossians 1, 27, 1, 28. They are so powerful, and they're such the target of what truly is apostolic teaching to build you in Christ. So we're going to journey into that. We're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. So there's your introduction. We want to jump into session one in this one. I used to do these sessions, and I would go to Genesis 1-1. I love to look at Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. I can do a whole session. It's just so powerful. But I can't do that. It didn't make sense to me to do that any longer without first talking about the glory of the Bible. And um, I was talking with some brothers today in a meeting and just talking about how we all, everything we do, we'll say the phrase, is, is, is it biblical? Is it biblical? Do I use my Bible? We're all using the Bible as Protestants, as evangelicals. But I think we sometimes take for granted that everyone knows what this book is, where it came from. Could you make a defense of why you're using this book at such a high level? I mean, we're all in here submitted, not to me, but to this book right now. You're going to judge what I do based on this book, and you should. Well, that's a big deal. This, this book right here, we don't center around a man or an organization on the planet. We center around the revelation in a book as we're 2,000 years out from the last events that were recorded by it. That's stunning. So I hope that you can, and I am going to endeavor in helping you get rooted in making an argument of why the scriptures are so important and relating with them in a spiritual way. So our title here was Reading and Relating with the God-Breathed and Infallible Words of God to the Church or the Glory of the Bible. So. You can look at these notes a little bit. I'm going to highlight some of them and then jump around. And, um, but let's, let's dive in here. So the scriptures found in the Bible are the primary source for and the, uh, the accurate revelation and understanding of who God is. This, this book is the only source on planet Earth. The 66 books in one you know, deal are the only trustworthy source for understanding who God is. And that's a, a, a tremendous statement. And, um, and if we're going to make that statement, then we need to be defend why it is. And, I, and again, I wonder if you know how to do that. I wonder if you'd be able to, in a spiritual way, in a prophetic way, in a powerful way to defend it. And I don't think you should say, well, I'm not into that. I'm not into apologetics. That's not my point. I'm not trying to help you be an arguer about the Bible. But I want you to make a defense of why you built your whole life around this. Why in the world am I submitting to it? It's got to be more than grandma and grandpa said to, and that's what the church does. You can do better than that. You can dive in and get your heart established. So the Bible is the apostolic and prophetic witness of who God is and what he's doing. So it's a book, but it's a book that's written by apostles and prophets. 
all right? Apostolic people, largely in the New Testament, in the New Testament only, are giving authoritative words. That's why the certain books are in there. And then the prophets are writing in the Old Testament and in the New also. And so these human beings, it's an amazing thing, are writing these words. The Bible is the most important and accurate book ever written in human history. It actually, the Bible, is the, is the only objective source, really, for us, for knowing the truth and reality about faith in God. So, a couple details about this. The Bible contains 66 books. There's 39 in the Old Testament, and there's 27 in the New Testament. Now, that's not the way it originally was. It wasn't a book. It wasn't in a neat, cool deal I got over it wherever I got it, Mardell's, all right? This, this was scrolls. They were scrolls and letters that were around and written, and then they were copied and copied and copied, okay? And so some of them, First and Second Samuel, are one scroll. Ezra and Nehemiah, one scroll, okay? So we have broke them out so that they're in this organized way. They didn't have chapters and verses, but they were letters that were given. And now what we have, though, that you would make an explanation about it to describe it is 66 books. Um, it was written by more than 40 human writers, and again, I put human on purpose. It wasn't dropped from heaven. There wasn't an angel. I mean, angels interact with humans, but humans are the vessel through which we're basing this invisible conviction we have about glory and about who God is. It was written over a span of 1,500 years. So from the first book, which might have been Job, probably wasn't Genesis, was probably Job, all the way to the Revelation is about 1,500 years. That's a long time. And from 40 different authors, from multiple different places. And they all are speaking and attesting to the same thing, to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's promised a Messiah. So it's phenomenal. And why we put those figures out there, or those numbers, is so you know how amazing it is. It wasn't like they were all talking to each other and conspiring to come up with a cool story. This is like a miracle that this thing happened 1,500 years over 40 people. It's a miracle. It's the most solid book in human history. About 4 billion of these books have been printed in just the last 50 years. This is the most popular book on planet Earth. It's the most sold book on planet Earth, and it well should be. We should be selling more. And I have, we've wasted a lot. Like, I've got 50 at my house. You know what I mean? I have a, a Bible buying addiction. I, I buy them and I sniff them. And I'm just, oh. I, ever since I was 10, I just wanted to buy every Bible I could. I'm always running in. I've got some more Bibles than I need, but I'll go to Mardell's and look, did somebody come up with another new way to, you know, to format it and put it down? And so, um, anyway, so we're wasting a lot of Bibles, is my point. But it's cool. I love the Bible. I love to, to hold them, to smell them, to read them, to mark them all up and mess them up, and then to get to my next one. And um, I just love the Bible. That's my experience, my testimony. You may remember at 10, I was born again and born again. And the biggest chunk of salt for me was my grandpa George McVeigh's Bible with a fifth grade education Southern Baptist deacon who had a Bible in the bathroom. <laughs> and I would see it in there and he had check marks by the chapters. And I was like, he meant so much to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the book of books to him. And that was the first thing that got me hooked in. And it was like, again, salt. It made me thirsty. And then I was like, this must be an amazing book because this guy that's so important to me really values it. Now, I needed more than that, but it was the entry point for me. It was the entry point of my value. I'm telling you, my brother Tim's mentioned, and I've had a couple of walking by my room and I'm on my knees reading my book and it kind of made him go, hmm. He likes the same things I like in life, three wheelers and basketball and all that, but look at him reading that Bible. And so I'm just saying, let your good work shine before people that you brag about the Bible could be the entry point for people. You're not enough to be long haul for them to stand against the devil. They can do better than knowing that you like it, <laughs> but it's the entry point. We need to be fans of the Bible. We need to be bragging about the Bible and what a glorious thing it is and fall in love with the word because it's such a great testimony. So let me give you some better reasons than Grandpa George for me of why this Bible is awesome, okay? Reasons for Bible uniqueness, it's maps. And again, I think we've emailed to the people on Zoom and you've got them right there. You may have seen this before. We've got a booklet, Why Trust the Bible, that has this in a very succinct way. But number one, the manuscript number and dates. Now don't get, hang in with me. I'll try to make maybe a boring subject a little bit understandable because this is actually phenomenal. But how we tell history is reliable history that we didn't live through <laughs> is through manuscripts. And it's the number of them 
how many do we have, and how close were they to the event when they, do we have the original or do we ha not have an original, and where, how close to the event was it written? Does that make sense? How many are there and how close to the event? So the Bible has 5,686 copies of the original. Some are under 50 years from the, moment, the time they were written. We don't have one original manuscript from the Bible. I don't know if you know that. We don't have one of Paul's original things he wrote or whoever wrote for him. We don't. What we have is copies that were preserved within communities. And we have the nearest one to when Paul did that or someone did it was about 50 years. Now, that may sound like a long time to you, but I'm about to show you why it's not. And we have 5,686 different ones that all match up at a 90, high 90% 90 level. They match each other and how they're doing. So I'm telling you that to say this. Well, let me, let me give you the example. The closest example to this in ancient works is Homer's Iliad. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. The Iliad. You study that sometimes in college. There are 643 ancient copies of it. And the original, the closest, the original, the manuscript we have to it is 400 years away. It's four centuries from when it was written. So this is the closest thing to the Bible. 600 and whatever. We've got 5,600 for the Bible, manuscripts and copies. Does that make sense? And the nearest manuscript for the Bible is 50 years from the original. The nearest one for the Iliad is 400. So here's my point. It's completely illogical to me that the Bible is not taught in every university in America. This is the most trustworthy, well-proven document on planet Earth. I know spiritually what it does for me, but I'm telling you, it's not just like, oh, we're kind of following this cult, Jesus cult, and we all feel good about it. This is a miracle. It's a miracle written by over 40 people, 1,500 years apart, with the number of manuscripts we have. It's just an amazing thing. It's the best proven history on planet Earth. Isn't that something? Some people think, oh, it's this superstitious book. Get it out of the schools. Get out. The, the way we prove history, the way we prove Caesar. I've got other examples of like Caesar. No one denies Caesar existed. We have like 30 copies, manuscripts at that time even existed. You know, and we all like, oh, that's for sure. The whole world says that. We've got way more about this. So manuscripts. Number two, archaeology. Archaeological findings have confirmed the Bible in multiple claims. I'm not going to go through that, but we have confirmation of a global flood, Israel's slavery in Egypt, the walls in Jericho. They found pieces of the wall, even that it fell inward, not outward. You know, I mean, just crazy, cool things, pieces of the boat of Noah, all that stuff that confirmed, confirmed, confirmed your Bible. So this acronym we're using is MAPS here. You got manuscripts, the miracle of that, the archaeological finding, read other sources, it's just too many things to read right here of how the Bible's been confirmed. And then thirdly is prophecy. This one is off the chart. Probably the most convincing proof of the Bible being a supernatural accurate source about God is fulfilled in prophecy. The Old Testament, written hundreds of years before Christ was born, lists 300 references of 191 specific prophecies about the Messiah. His first coming, by the way. And they're all fulfilled in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 191. Where he was born, how he would move around, he'd be chased around, moved down to Egypt. I mean, the details are unbelievable through Isaiah and all these places. 191 prophecies about a 30-year life of this guy that we only have about three years of his life recorded are fulfilled in his life. It's, it's astounding. It's, it's off the chart. I mean... That's why, you know, the cults are always trying to explain Mormonism, Jehovah Witness. They've got their prophets. One guy wrote this when he had an encounter with an angel in the woods. Then he made the prophecy about the second coming. Didn't happen. Made it again. Didn't happen. Made it. It's like this small number of prophecies that don't happen. We've got unbelievable stunning that the virgin will be with a child. That she'll be born, he'll be born in Bethlehem, this tiny little town of 300. I mean, that there would be weeping and war, that there'd be a kind of a, a try to slaughter the, the children, what, how he would move and through the Galilee is prophesied in that time. And then about 30 prophecies are fulfilled in six hours when he's on the cross. I mean, Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, just in detail. And these are the passages that drive Jewish people who don't believe in him crazy that he would be 
pierced for our transgressions. Isaiah 53 says that. He was, by his stripes will be healed, that they'll pierce his hand and feet, that they'll gamble for his clothes. All of that is clearly said a thousand to seven hundred years or so before Jesus ever shows up. So that's awesome. There are, besides their prophecies about Jesus, there are many prophecies about towns and cities and about one example is Cyrus. Cyrus is the king in Ezra that gives favor for them to rebuild the temple. He's prophesied 100 to 150 years before he's ever born in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah, I, I believe it, in Isaiah, is it, what is it, 45? Cyrus, a guy named Cyrus, is probably, he's not born. He's 100 to 150 years later. And then suddenly he shows up in Ezra 1, 100 to 150 years later, exactly as what was prophesied by him with riches and he supplies for the deal. So this issue of fulfilled prophecy is the primary. If you didn't have the manuscripts, you didn't have the archaeology, which we do, this alone should make everybody in the world go, oh my gosh. And I, the, the only Jewish guy I've ever led to Jesus, it was through Isaiah 53 and Psalms 22. I've told the story. I said, the guy said, he agreed with me. I caught him at a coffee shop, cornered him, and then he agreed with me. He'd read the Bible with me. And my big challenge, he goes, where are we going to read? I go, hmm, how about Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22? You read that, let's just come back and talk about what's in there. <laughs> guy comes back convinced about Jesus, like, oh my gosh, it's right in there. And it was prophesied before it happened. And so... Um, Anyway, so love, love this fulfilled prophecy. And by the way, there's two to three times what's been fulfilled about Jesus more to be fulfilled in the second coming. You're, you're setting, and knowing those can buoy your heart and understand the prophetic revelation in the book of Revelation and other places about the end times. Lastly, then, the S in maps is spiritual inward affirmation. And I don't want to say much about this because this is an experiential one, but it is one. The scriptures confirm themselves as re reliable to the human spirit. They are self-authenticating. Now, someone could say that about the Book of Mormon or say it about, you know, whatever, some weird book. I get that. But you know, I think you know, when you read it, something happens inside you. It's self-authenticating. I've got all this evidence. I've got all this tradition. I've got all this stuff. But the scriptures themselves speak to me. When I read them, it's not like reading another novel. <laughs> I'm reading the words from God, and my inner man begins to attest and say amen as the author of the scriptures is inside me, and we have this divine connection, okay, this ark. So that's maps. You can make this argument. You can tell people, you know, they're, the Bible's foolish. Man, have you, do you know about the manuscripts? Do you know about the archaeology? Do you know about the fulfilled prophecy? And in that itself, it speaks to so many people's spirit. So, amen. So I want to give you that. Hopefully that's not too much into apologetics and bores you, but actually I think you need to be rooted in that. That's the basic information that believers ought to know so that we don't act like we're just doing what grandma and grandpa did. <laughs> because Grandpa George, that was awesome. But I went beyond him to going, oh, this book, beyond him, okay, is the most trustworthy book on the planet, supernatural in what it is, and I've still got a bunch of it to be fulfilled. So I'm interacting with the glory of it. So this last part of this session, and this is what we want to talk about, is the keys to reading and relating with the Bible, all right? And so hang with me. Some of these things are things you've heard us talk about but they're really, really important for understanding the Bible, I think, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual way. Number one, the Jesus hermeneutic. Hermeneutic means just a tool for interpretation, okay? If you go to seminary or something, what's your hermeneutic? It means how I'm interpreting. And many people have theological biases and various experiences, and it becomes their hermeneutic. But I'm telling you that I believe what the best hermeneutic is, is the Jesus hermeneutic. And that's the reason that we say that, is because in John 5.39... Jesus is going to say this amazing statement to the Pharisees. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Some of these guys and the scribes had memorized whole scrolls. Like they memorized the whole book of Isaiah. They memorized the Psalms. I mean, can you imagine? To the details and then we're writing it down. He's saying, you guys have made an art out of searching for eternal life or the gift from God from just these scriptures. And it's they, he says, that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. When he does that, that's a powerful moment. 
Because he's saying, you guys alone are looking at the scriptures. There's no way you're going to understand Genesis unless you're looking from me. Unless you look through the lens of me. These Genesis, Exodus, Noah's boat talking about me. It's preaching me. And you'll see when we go through these sessions, for whatever part of them you're part of, that's how we're going to do it. We're going to look through the lens of Jesus, and we're going to understand this. And we're doing it because he authoritatively said that. I don't have here, but in Luke 24, at the end of that, Jesus is walking on Emmaus Road with some guys. And they don't recognize him. And as he talks about the scriptures, he says their hearts burned within them. Well, what they described he was doing was he's, he was explaining himself, the Messiah and his centrality from Moses all through the prophets. And that really takes you from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And so he was explaining, this is all about the Messiah, the Messiah, about he would come to Christ. And don't you know he's come? And then suddenly he, he breaks bread with them and they notice him. And then they go, oh my gosh, what are our hearts burning within us? And so, um, but he again in that place is going to say, I'm the centerpiece of the scriptures. And so I don't mean when you get to the measurements of the boat, you're going, wait a minute, 30 cubics. So how does that relate to Jesus? Okay, stay in the spirit of what we're talking about. We mean the overarching sty uh, uh, stories and how they're talking about it. Because the boat and salvation and you go in something and escape the wrath of God, that's Jesus. That we go in Christ, he is our ark, okay? And we're in him. The whole story is preaching about and giving us a forerunner thing of the end times and how Christ is where we go. So we look through and we see Jesus in the creation story. We're going to see him in Adam and Eve. We're going to see him all the way through Abraham and the seed of him through there. And it's the right way to read your Bible. Number two, the Bible is supernatural creative word. God, it's God breathed or out from God which means not from this natural world. So 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed is useful, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. So that's an interesting phrase, God breathed. So when you see that phrase about the word of God or about scriptures, it's telling you God doesn't have to breathe, by the way. It's not like he got his breath over on it. What this is speaking of is it came out from him and it released out from the supernatural realm revelation. That's what we're talking about here. God, the God stuff, out from him, he uses the metaphor of breathing. And it's really got the dynamic of the spirit and all that's there. But if you read that phrase, you got to think, if you know your Bible, that that's the way God made man. He took the dust and he breathed in. And so man is supernaturally, he not just formed, the animals and all that are formed by God, all right? Man is formed in his body, but to get man to be man, man and woman, there's the breath of God. What comes out from him makes man the image of God. Does that make sense? And so you read that and you go, oh my gosh, these words, these scriptures are the breath of God affecting me. They're the breath of God. When I read this word, it's God breathing in me. Or another word, it's what's coming out from God in, in touching my inner man, developing, uh, producing the divine qualities within me. Okay? And so that alone should cause people to have Bible studies. I mean, that's a good reason to interact with this supernatural living word is that it's the breath of God. It's inspired. It was on the writers, and then it affects us in that way. Number three, the Word of God is the spirit manifestation of the thoughts of God. Now, stay with me. Words, I contend, are the most powerful things on planet Earth. Words are what create. Words are what? But words are really the incarnation. They're the means of articulating what? Thought. I think, and then I speak. Okay, so that's what's happening really in the creation story. God the Father is thinking about the heavens and the earth. Then it says, and God said, which Jesus is called the Word. He speaks the Word. Let there be light. Let there be an expanse. Let there be a giraffe, whatever it is, okay? He's speaking it, and it really the speaking is the articulation of the very inner thought of the Lord, and then that manifests power. It creates reality as we know it. So in 1 Corinthians 2.11, it says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the 
thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God knows these deep, I mean, just think about God's thinking, your brain. I mean, maybe you're thinking now, you're like, you're focused on what I'm doing and you may have drifted off and you're thinking about the snack tonight. I don't know. But, I mean, a person's thought life is something. It's phenomenal. And then often we're taking those thoughts and expressing those in words. Or what is the eternal thought life like? Eternal thinking. God thinking without any kind, you know, the purity of it, the righteousness, the depth of it. And then him taking time to speak those thoughts, to frame them up in a way that you and I could hear them and they get in us and then they're dynamically alive. That's, that's a phenomenal thing. And so the Spirit of God who knows his thoughts gives that. So 12 says, Now we've not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, and that we might impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. And here's what your Bible is. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The Bible is taking the thoughts of God by the Spirit of God and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language. And so it takes actually supernatural ability to understand these words and to interact with them. Hebrews 11.3 will say, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are seen or visible. And so another relating with the Word of God, a motivation for it, is that every time I read the Word with faith in my heart, it begins to do a work of creation, I think. My soul is edified and cleaned. It's touched. It's, it's the blood of Jesus to wash away our sin. I'm not talking about that kind of cleanness. But I'm talking about breath of God interacting with me, Word of God that created the universe. I mean, there is nothing but God. Then God thinks something, speaks that something, and then manifest that something. That's a phenomenal deal. Out of nothingness and invisibility came the visible world, a galaxy that we still can't with all of our technology measure. It's just beyond us. But it's, that's the thought of God, the eternality and how he created in its glory and its uniformness. And so when I relate with that word, I'm, I'm relating with the creative dynamic word of God that can do dynamic things in me. Number four, the Word of God is the only true divider which br that brings order. And here's what I mean by this. In a disordered world, Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God, it's living and active, that's your, the words from God, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Men and women are mixed up. We're, we're a mess. And the only thing that can divide... The true divine is the very words of God. And where we see this first really is, in the, is on the, the creation days. And we'll get there next week um, when we get into Bible and start unpacking Jesus and seeing it. But if you'll remember, God's first three actions are division, right? He divides light and darkness. He divides sky and sea. And he divides land and water. There, then the next three, he's going to put life in the divine. Where he brought the, division is what brings order out of chaos. The earth's in chaos. It's messy. Our lives are in chaos. And the only thing that brings order is that the Word of God comes and divides in me between what's the soulish, natural man junk, the flesh, and what's the spirit realm. Does that make sense? And so we need that split. What's in the, natu in the realm? What's reality? Is fame and money and, you know, there's a division made by the Word of God that shows me where reality is. And he showed that by the first day of creation. Great. Lastly. The Word of God is um, unfailing. And I just have on your notes there, Isaiah 55. I lo love that passage. Uh, verse 10 and 11, uh, for as rain comes down, waters the earth and produces the stuff, you know, so the Word of God will never return void or it will supernaturally supply, whatever your version is. It's going to, the Word of God will never, ever fail. And then Jesus will say in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. That's a, that's, that's a, a heightenedness of value to this. So when I and everybody that's looking on the planet for promises to live by, which they are, whether it's insurance, inheritance, it's this, that we're all looking for promises to lean on, to trust in. The Bible is the place. 
It has got the unfailing word of God. And when I'm going, I'm treasure hunting for those. I'm treasure hunting through Psalms. I'm digging. I'm panning for gold. Now, it's all gold, but I'm looking for that promise that I begin to lean my faith on. I begin to get in, and then I begin to, it begins to conform my heart and, and transform my thinking to divide between flesh and spirit and to empower me to live in this realm. So, this whole session was to give you a little bit of practical why your Bible's awesome, <laughs> and then to bait you, whet your appetite, that you might know you're interacting with a supernatural dynamic thing in the Scripture, and it is a valid deal that we spend our time gathering around this and listening to it and evaluating everything we do by it. It's the best source on the planet. I love Napoleon's quote, one of my favorite. Napoleon the Conqueror said, the Bible is no mere book. You ever heard this? It's a creature that conquers everyone who interacts with it. That was like a global conqueror. And he's like, the Bible's not normal. <laughs> it's got this supernatural power that conquers and changes and transforms. And so... And um, sometimes in charismatic realms and streams, which I love, by the way, I'm not, that's not, a, but sometimes I've seen a lower value on the word. And that's a bummer because the word is the most supernatural thing we've got. <laughs> and it's the order, it's the apostolic and prophetic revelation. So we want to get more established in that stream and those streams. Even we love, you know, prophetic ministry and those kind of things. But that's why I'm always, if you see us doing training in that, I'm always relating to scriptures all the time. Because I don't, we can't build our ministry or our manifestations on our experience, on our feelings. It's just, it's just we've got a better foundation, which is the word of God. The, the evangelical conservative sometimes have so worshipped it, you, we use the word bi bibliolatry, that they'll miss the dynamic of what the words are trying to communicate. I'm not just worshiping these words. I'm worshiping Yahweh who these words communicate to me about. And so making the spiritual jump, I, it's, it's power and it's, and yes, and, you know, but you don't take it then as I'm judging everyone and knocking them over the head and I'm arguing with everybody. They become these living words that lead into an organic living relationship with the Father as I am hearing from the invisible realm, hearing language that's never, okay, that's glorious from the Bible to be able to relate with the Lord. And so I just, again, want to encourage you to read your Bible. I, my testimony is no one ever told me to. I didn't get that religious thing on me. I never did. But by the grace of God, had a hunger for it, and I didn't know what I had. I basically had, you know, I had a keg, keg of dynamite, and I didn't know it. I didn't know I was reading the, tr the, the most supernatural book on the planet. I fell into it in a family line. And I've been unpacked, even now while I'm talking to you, this, you know, this is always that first session. Why do you start with the Bible? Because everything we do is from the Bible. And I want to see a higher value in people's hearts for the Bible. Not in a religious way we judge each other, okay? And not, not in, a, in a manipulative way, but uh, to know what the scriptures are, the glory of them. And so there, there's, there's so much in here. That's why when I deal with evangelical people, maybe that say they don't have any gifts of the Spirit, I'm... This is my smart aleck deal. I'm just more conservative than you. I can't be as liberal as you are. And mark out, I've got Bible verses that tell me prophesy. Tongues, I don't, anyway. So it makes me a nice smart aleck, if you will, in the, in the scripture. So, but I, I want us to, we gotta be biblical. We wanna be biblical, and by that we don't mean religious. We mean interacting with a living creature <laughs> that are the scriptures. And this, I'm telling you, this book has transformed the world. We wouldn't be where we are. This would be, I'm telling you, it'd be a hell hole of people eat, suicidal eating each other alive if this book hadn't transformed kings and cultures. Kings and Western civilization is built on this, not on free enterprise. Free enterprise is just how we move goods around. This is what formed what we are. <laughs> You know, I mean, Europe, it was transformed by revivals, revivals, reformations, calling back to this Bible. People shed their blood so you could get this book. You know that? John Huss, John Wycliffe in the 1500s. The church itself didn't want the Bible in the hands of lay people. 
They only wanted the priest to do it, so they burned them with a stake and killed many that were trying to translate this into the language of the people. It was in Latin, and only certain priests knew that. That People died so you would get this book today. And it's worth it. It was totally worth it. You'll hug them when you get in the new heaven and the new earth. You'll go, thank you, thank you. And all I'm doing is trying to increase your appreciation right now because we go deep in the Bible, deep in the Bible, and we'll go deep in Jesus and deep in the kingdom of God. Amen?